Good evening and welcome to our theology class. This evening we are taking up the topic of man, man in his sin and the effects of the fall. And this is a necessary lesson, not necessarily a cheerful, joyful lesson, as we will be looking at man as he falls from his state of perfection into a state of corruption. I want to start this evening's lesson by doing reading number seven. This comes from the book Human Nature in Its Fourfold State. That book was written by Thomas Boston. And I begin with a bit of the introductory material in the book. If ever a book was steeped in prayer, it was that fourfold state. From the Tuesday in January 1712, when Boston first put pen to paper for the final draft, it was spread daily before a throne of grace and found its place in every family fast. It was not until November 1720 that Boston handled a bound copy of his work. Almost immediately, it took a hold. New editions were called for, and testimonies of its usefulness came pouring in. It was discussed in Edinburgh drawing rooms. The shepherd read it on the hills. It made its way into the highland crofts, where stained and tattered copies of the earlier editions may still be found. For more than a hundred years, its influence upon the religious life of Scotland was incalculable. And though the interests and the great and, and the outlook are very changed today, and the book itself is very little read, there are great parts of Scotland in which one cannot move among the people and catch the accent of their more serious talk and listen to their prayers without perceiving, howsoever dimly, that the influence of Boston's masterpiece is not is unexhausted yet. There are four things very necessary to be known by all that would see heaven. First, what man was in the state of innocence as God made him. Two, what he is in the state of corrupt nature as he hath unmade himself. Three, what he must be in the state of grace as created in Christ Jesus unto good works, if ever he be made a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. And four, what he will be in his eternal state as made by the judge of all, either perfectly happy or completely min miserable, and that forever. These are weighty points that touch the vitals of practical godliness from which most men and even many professors in these dregs of time are quite estranged. I design, therefore, under the divine conduct to open these things and apply them. That comes from page 37. It's kind of his thesis for the book. Now, others have taken up Boston's scheme, and they have summarized it as follows. First of all, the state of innocence. Passe peccare et passe non peccare. That is Latin for able to sin and able not to sin. This is Adam and Eve in the garden. Then, secondly, the state of sinfulness. Non passe, non peccare. Or in other words, not able not to sin. This is man in his fallen condition. This is Adam and Eve after their fall in sin. Thirdly, the state of grace, passe non peccare, able not to sin. And then finally, fourthly, the state of glory, non passe peccare, not able to sin. So Adam and Eve, before the fall, were able to sin and able not to sin. 
Then as a result of their fall, they were not able not to sin. When men and women are brought into a state of grace, they are again able not to sin. And we will in glory not be able to sin. Now tonight we want to focus on the second of these four states, the state of sinfulness, the state of corrupt nature, as man hath unmade himself. So we look first at man's fall into sin, and in order to appreciate that fall, we need to see the height from which Adam fell. Turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 1, and we want to read from verse 26 through verse 31. So Genesis 1, 26 through 31. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, and it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth, which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. So here is Adam, made in God's image, and Eve, likewise, in God's image. And they have a free, open relationship with God, their creator. In fact, he comes and he walks and he converses with them in the garden in the cool of the day. And as the image bearer of God, man is to rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle and all the beasts of the earth, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God has assigned man to be his vice regent, to rule over the world. God has provided for them. He has given them food, every green plant yielding seed, and all the fruit trees yielding seed. There's an abundance of good, nourishing, delicious food. But there's also the blessing of God calling them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. God has given man a wife. They are together and the two become one flesh. And they are there under God's blessing and protection. They are doing God's work. And as God looks upon them and sees them, he says, it's very good. Everything is very good. Adam and Eve were sinless in the garden. And so man was in a very high and holy and privileged position. Thomas Boston speaks to this. He says, Adam was the favorite of heaven. He shone brightly in the image of God who cannot but love his own image wherever it appears. While he was alone in the world, he was not alone, for God was with him. His communion and fellowship were with his creator, and that immediately. For as yet there was nothing to turn away the face of God from the work of his own hands, seeing sin had not yet entered, which could alone make the breach. Man was the favorite of heaven. He had direct, immediate fellowship and communion with God, his creator. 
Everything around him was perfect and good and holy. There was nothing evil or broken or bent or vicious in the world. And so Adam was at the pinnacle, the height. But we see the essence of the problem entering into this perfect environment. Turn now in your Bible to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Now here is what is commonly called the probationary test given to Adam and Eve. Every tree of the garden was given to them to eat from. They had the full run of the whole garden except for that one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God says, from that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. And then he warns them, in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Now, not only is this a specific particular tree, which is placed out of bounds, but there is a test here to see whether Adam will obey God's word. God has given him a commandment. Do not eat from that tree. And the test is this. Will Adam submit his will to God's word? Will he obey the Lord's command? Will he refrain from doing what God has prohibited? Or will man go ahead, transgress the commandment, violate God's authority, and do what God had forbidden? That's the test. Now we go on to Genesis chapter 3, and in Genesis 3, we are introduced to the serpent. And the serpent is there in the garden, and he singles out Eve, and he is tempting Eve. And we pick up, really, in verse... um, Let's just go back to verse 1, start the chapter. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Now as we consider that scene, we see that immediately upon beginning the conversation, the serpent is challenging God's word. Indeed, has God said? And then he misrepresents what God had actually said. This was not an innocent mistake on the part of the serpent. This was the devil twisting God's word and putting false words into God's mouth so as to confuse and to disrupt the woman from her trust and her obedience to God. The woman rather naively answers, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. You see, that's the positive command. 
But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Now, people have been rather critical of Eve at this point, saying, well, she added to what God actually said. Well, that is technically true, but she doesn't really add to the substance. She doesn't really change what God has said. She is reporting accurately that that tree is out of bounds. They are not to take fruit from the tree. They are not to eat from that tree. And now the serpent attacks directly God's authority. He says to the woman, you surely will not die. You see, he's pitting himself and his word against God and God's word. And then he goes on to impugn God's motives, suggesting that God is somehow jealously protecting a privilege that would be good for Eve to have, but God is being very, very protective and does not want Eve to enjoy this good thing. And so here is Satan directly attacking God, his integrity, his truth, his motives, his goodness. And here is the problem. The woman listened, and she began looking at the tree, and she sees it is good for food. She saw that it was a delight to the eyes, and she considered that the tree was desirable to make one wise. She is falling prey to Satan's lies. And then she reached out her hand and took the fruit and ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened as she and her husband both ate from the tree. They broke God's command. They violated God's prohibition. God said, you shall not eat. And they said, yes, we will. They were rejecting God's authority. They were throwing aside God's sovereign rule over them. They did not live by his word, but instead they lived by their own opinions as those opinions were massaged by Satan. Satan is pushing them to be sinfully autonomous, to be a law unto themselves. And Eve takes the bait. And Eve takes the action. Now, people are critical here of Adam, and I think rightly so. Where is Adam in the midst of all this? He's obviously there in the garden. He's at hand so that she can give him a piece of the fruit and he eats with her. He's there, but he's passive. He does not stand up to protect his wife and to do battle with this wicked serpent. But instead, he passively allows his wife to be deceived. And then he participates with her in the very sin that God said they must not do. Now there's a reference to this in the book of 1 John, so turn in your Bible to 1 John chapter 3. First John 3, and this gives us um, kind of a, an interpretation of what went on. 1 John 3, verse 4 says, Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Here's a definition of sin. Sin is lawlessness, a breaking of the law, a disregarding of the commandments. And this is precisely and exactly what Adam and Eve did when they sinned. They practiced lawlessness. No longer were they submitting to God's word, to God's command. Now they were a law to themselves, and they were living however they pleased. 
God said no, they said yes. And this is really the essence of sin. It's a rejection of God's authority, a refusal to obey God's word. It is declaring oneself to be God and living by the rules you set for yourself. So what is the result then of sin? What is the effect upon the human race? Well, we want to go to Genesis chapter 3, which again gives us a good, clear understanding of the results of human sin. And we start in Genesis 3, really at verse 14, with God's dealings with the serpent. The Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you, shall eat, you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat from the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now the man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and clothed them. Then the Lord said, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, as a result of that sin of our first parents, God places the whole creation under his wrath and curse. His curse is against the serpent, and God declares warfare against Satan and his dominion until Christ shall come and crush the head of the serpent. But he also puts woman under his curse. He greatly multiplies her pain in childbirth so that in pain she will bring forth children. Every time a child is born into this world, there is an echo of that curse placed upon Eve in the Garden of Eden as she experiences significant and severe pain. As I have been with my own wife, in the birth of each of our six children, I have seen that pain and it is profound. But then there's also the curse that her desire would be for her husband and he would rule over her. Now this desire that's spoken of here is not a loving desire or even a sexual desire. It is a desire for the man's place and position and role. The wife, the woman, is striving after her husband's place. She wants to take his role, but he rules over her. So we have conflict between women and men, between husbands and wives, 
There is a power struggle that goes on within marriage often as to who is in charge, who is in control. And those power struggles between husbands and wives are again a testimony to the curse that God has placed man under. So because Eve sinned by giving the fruit to her husband in contradiction to God's command, she now has strife in her home. And she wants his place, but he rules over her. And there is friction and there is tension. Now for Christians, as we come to faith in Christ and begin understanding our roles in marriage, that friction and tension can be largely reduced and there can be cooperation and harmony. But still at times that struggle resurfaces and that curse is again visited upon even Christians in their marriages as they struggle between husband and wife. But probably the most profound curse is upon Adam, because Adam knew what he was doing, and he willfully chose to follow his wife's direction instead of doing what God had commanded. And God emphasizes this, because you listen to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. In other words, Adam, you listen to Eve, but you wouldn't listen to me. You were supposed to obey me, but instead you obeyed Eve. And because of your choice, your knowing choice to disregard my word and to prefer the word and suggestion of your wife, here is your curse. The ground is cursed because of you. By toil, You will eat from it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles will grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. Just a few days ago, I went out into my garden and was looking at the earth, getting ready for plowing it up and getting ready to plant my garden for the season. And you know what's growing in my garden already? Thistles, weeds. Lots of them. And that's what happens. Any gardener, any farmer knows this. You are constantly fighting against weeds, thorns, thistles, all kinds of plants you didn't plant, but somehow they grow so much more robust and healthy than the plants that you did plant. And so thorns and thistles are the constant battle of everyone who tills the soil. And this is what Adam was given as his curse. He wasn't set free to simply lead an easy life, but rather by the sweat of his face, he would eat his bread and he would do it until he returned to the ground and became dust once again. And so Adam and Eve are put under God's curse And that curse will last them until the day they die. And they would surely die because they sinned against God's command. Now there's another passage which also instructs us on this. Turn to Exodus 34. Exodus 34 verses 6 and 7. This is when the Lord is speaking to Moses on the mountain. Then the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. There is an intergenerational aspect to sin. 
really when Adam and Eve sinned and were placed under God's wrath and curse, that was not for them alone. It was for them and all of their posterity. The sins of the fathers are visited on the children to the third and fourth generation. And so as man sins, those sins go down through the generations to his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren. Sin is never isolated, and God's wrath and curse are never isolated to just one individual or one generation. And as we study the history of the world, and as we see God's people, we see how sins are passed down from father to son to grandson to great-grandson. And oftentimes those sins that are found in the fathers are even intensified in their their posterity after them. So as a result of man's sin, God's wrath comes upon generations, upon the whole human race, really. So what was the impact then of sin upon man? Again, we go back to Genesis. Now we're looking at Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Genesis 6, verse 5. This is before the flood. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So as the human race is spreading out and growing, as more and more children are being born to the descendants of Adam and Eve, there is a great increase in the wickedness of the human race. In fact, the wickedness of man on the earth was very great. God saw it. And he knew that every intent of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. There's no good there. There's no redeeming qualities. There's no desire to do the right thing. There is only evil continually. That's what man's heart has become. Now we see a testimony to the sinfulness of man in Jeremiah chapter 17. So turn in your Bible to Jeremiah 17 verses 9 and 10. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. God is the searcher of hearts. He tests the minds of men, and he declares the heart is more deceitful than anything else. The heart of man is desperately sick. It is beyond comprehension, beyond our understanding. So are human beings basically inherently good? No, They're basically inherently wicked. They are deceitful. They are evil. They are corrupt. We also see this in Isaiah chapter 59. So turn back to Isaiah 59, verse 2. Isaiah 59, verse 2. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. You see, our iniquities, our sins create a breach, a separation between us and our God. Because of our sins, he has hidden his face from us so that he does not hear us. You see, our sin our rebellion, our evil, 
has created a breach between us and God. And that breach is our fault. It's not his fault. It's not a problem he has put upon us. It is a problem we have made for ourselves. Another passage which speaks about the impact of sin upon man is Ephesians 2. Turn to the New Testament. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. You see, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We're alive, we're walking, we're acting, we're doing deeds, but we're spiritually dead. In our fallen condition, we are spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins. And so as we live according to the lusts of the flesh, the desires of the flesh and of the mind, we are children of God's wrath. And this is true not only for a few individuals, it's true of the entire human race, which is what Paul means when he says, even as the rest. The rest of what? The rest of the human race. So we were all dead in our trespasses. We are all walking according to the prince of the power of the air, that evil spirit, Satan, who is now working in the sons of disobedience. And so man is spiritually dead. Now it's important to realize he's not just sick. He's not really, really sick. No, he's dead. He's dead spiritually, dead in his trespasses and sins. Now if we turn over to Ephesians chapter 4, we see still another description of man in his fallen condition. So this I say, starting at verse 17 of chapter 4, So this I say, and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. This is fallen humanity. They are walking in the futility of their mind. Their understanding has been darkened by sin. They are excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their granite hearts. They have become callous. They have given themselves over to sensuality, for the practice of every kind of impurity, and they are greedy for more and more. See, this does not paint a very flattering picture of the human race. This does not say, oh, men are basically good. No, men are corrupt and evil and hard and dark and wicked. Very wicked. Thomas Boston says, we have seen what man was as God made him, a lovely and happy creature. Let us view him now as he has unmade himself, and we shall see him a sinful and miserable creature. This is the sad state we are brought into by the fall, a state as black and doleful as the former was glorious. And this we commonly call the state of nature, or 
man's natural state. And Boston is true. Adam and Eve in the garden were lovely and happy creatures. But because of what they did, they became sinful and miserable creatures. And we all, the entire human race, are now in a state as black and doleful as our former state was glorious and delightful. And so man in his natural state is a sinful and miserable creature. So we see man's destiny and man's existence as a fallen creature. He is the living dead. Turn to Romans chapter 1. We see in Romans 1 a picture of man in this state. Starting at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So you see, God's wrath is against man because in his unrighteousness and his ungodliness, he is suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. And as he suppresses the truth in unrighteousness, he is being hardened in sin's deceitfulness. Even though he knows there is a God, even though he knows God ought to be worshipped, deserves to be worshipped, yet man is exchanging the glory of the incorruptible God for these images and idols of creatures. And so in his futility and his foolishness and his darkness, man becomes an idolater. An idolater who is bowing down and worshiping images he has made of creatures. And there's a certain kind of insanity to idolatry. You make the image, you craft it, you finish it, you set it up, and then you bow down to the image you have made. It's insanity. You're worshiping the work of your own hands. You're not worshiping a God. You're worshiping a lifeless piece of matter. And that's all it ever is. And so in God's wrath, he is pouring out his judgments against unrighteous, ungodly, idolatrous men who are suppressing his truth in their unrighteousness. Going on in that same chapter, starting at verse 28. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. So you see, here is man gone to seed, fallen man, 
in all of his unfettered wickedness and evil. And as he practices all of these things, and as he becomes such a worthless, worthless creature, he knows full well that God will punish those who do such things with death. But he continues to approve of such sin, and he himself practices it so that he too is worthy of eternal damnation. Jesus speaks about man and his fallen condition and his uh, worthless life in Matthew chapter 25. So turn back to Matthew 25. Picking up at verse 41, as the Son of Man upon the throne is rendering judgment to the goats, those who are on his left. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So Jesus has harsh words of judge, judgment and justice to those who have lived wicked lives, who have refused to obey his commands, who have not cared for his people. They go off into eternal punishment to the death of hell, the lake which burns with fire, which is the second death. The righteous go to eternal life. There they will enjoy eternal happiness in the presence of God and his people. But the wicked will only go to eternal torment, to damnation in the depths of hell. And so man in his fallen state is in a horrible spot. And you might say, well, pastor, that's a very negative and discouraging message that you have in this lesson. And I have to agree with you. Yes, it is. It's very sobering, isn't it? Very discouraging. But next lesson, we are going to look at justification and sanctification. This is where we start to see the tide turn and the good news of the gospel coming to our rescue. I don't think that you can understand how truly good the good news is until you understand how truly bad human beings have made themselves, how we have unmade ourselves, as Thomas Boston put it. Well, I will hope to see you again next week on the lesson on justification and sanctification. May the Lord bless these things to you.